Measuring intraocular pressure is a pillar of management of patients who have glaucoma. So this is a talk on how to measure intraocular pressure or tonometry. Intraocular pressure, as will be emphasized many times throughout this curriculum, is not a part of the diagnosis of glaucoma. It's simply a risk factor for developing glaucoma. But because we cannot treat glaucomatous optic neuropathy directly, we treat the one risk factor that we can impact, which is intraocular pressure. So we have a real interest in intraocular pressure, also called IOP. Much of what I'm going to say over the next few minutes is covered in the talk on ocular hypertension. I don't think it hurts to repeat it. The mean intraocular pressure is 15.5 millimeters of mercury. If we take the normal plus or minus two standard deviations that we use for most features of the human body, that would make the normal range 10 to 21 millimeters of mercury. There's also considerable fluctuation in the intraocular pressure, two to six millimeters of mercury throughout the day. So if you measured my pressure, it would not be 14 millimeters of mercury every time you measured it. It would fluctuate some. And there's more fluctuation in patients who have glaucoma. So this is a bell-shaped curve. Mean intraocular pressure, 15.5 millimeters of mercury. If we apply plus or minus two standard deviations, that would give us 10 to 21 millimeters of mercury. But the intraocular pressure curve is not bell-shaped. It's skewed to the right. So there are very few people walking around with intraocular pressures under 10 millimeters of mercury, unless they've had filtering surgery of some form. But there are lots of people who have intraocular pressures above 21 millimeters of mercury and this represents about 10% of adults. Those are patients that we consider to have ocular hypertension, and that's the subject of another part of this curriculum. Lots of things can impact the pressure that one gets if the patient is holding his or her breath. If a baby is crying, the intraocular pressures are totally unreliable. Valsalva maneuver, the place that, we, that I see this is in patients who are uh, short and really heavy, particularly through the chest. If they have to pull themselves into the slit lamp, that can really raise the intraocular pressure. And some of those people don't fit the equipment in my clinic, and we need to check their pressure with a Perkins tonometer or a tonopen or something where they don't have to be pulling themselves into the slit lamp. It's easy to push on the globe particularly in an eye that is very large, a highly myopic or bupthalmic eye. And anything that affects the cornea can affect the Goldman intraocular pressure, astigmatism, edema, scarring. There are things that can artificially raise pressure, anything that raises the episcleral venous pressure, like wearing an extremely tight necktie, playing a wind instrument, bending over, lying supine, Hopefully patients are not playing wind instruments while you're checking their intraocular pressure. If one rapidly ingests a large quantity of fluid, that can make the intraocular pressure transiently elevate. And so that's the, the process behind the water drinking provocative test. It's really not done anymore, where someone would drink a liter of fluid and then we would measure the pressure to see how well the eye adapted to this big fluid load. We all know that corticosteroids can, uh, over the long haul, elevate intraocular pressure. There are things that can artificially lower the intraocular pressure. Extensive aerobic exercise can cause the pressure to go down transiently. General anesthesia, so this is important for babies who are having examinations under anesthesia that we need to check the pressure before the anesthetic lowers their intraocular pressure. Pregnancy can lower intraocular pressure, although I have really not seen that as much as I would like in the patients that I've managed. Alcohol ingestion and, of course, marijuana. But the lowering, the pressure lowering of marijuana is offset by the fact that it decreases systemic blood pressure 
which is not necessarily a great thing for the optic nerve. There are lots of ways to measure the intraocular pressure. There are three that I think are worth discussing in a little bit of detail. Uh, applination, strain gauge or go tonal pen, and then the rebound or eye care tonometry. But I'll mention a few others. And Shiatz uh, is something that is discussed a lot. I never use the Shiatz tonometer in my clinic, but one might need to in uh, certain situations where access to equipment is poor. So at the very end of this talk, after the closing credits, I will talk about Shiatz tonometry. Applination tonometry is the gold standard. This is what I believe most glaucoma specialists use in their clinics to take care of most patients. It does not work on all patients, but it is a very fine way of measuring intraocular pressure. It's based on a formula called the Imbert Fick formula that determines the force required to flatten a perfect thin-walled sphere. Of course, the eye is neither perfect nor thin-walled. And this is the Imbert Fick formula. Pressure is force divided by area. The Goldman Applination Tonometer contains a biprism that flattens a cornea over an area of 3.06 millimeters in diameter. There's very little fluid displacement within the eye when the tonometry is being performed. At this diameter, the tear is capillary attraction so that the tear is pulling the tono tip towards the globe is balanced by the cornea's resistance to being flattened. And this is true for a cornea of average thickness. So it's most accurate at 520 microns. Thick corneas overestimate the pressure. Thin corneas under, uh, underestimate the pressure. So to perform this, the eye is topically anesthetized and fluorescein dye is administered, usually in a single drop that has both anesthetic and the dye. Failure to use fluorescein will result in underestimating the intraocular pressure. So one can still see Myers, the little half circles, but they will not be wide enough to get an accurate intraocular pressure. The tonometer tip is brought into contact with the eye and the examiner looking through the oculars will visualize a pair of half circles called Myers and adjust the dial on the tonometer until the inner margins of the semicircles align. So this is the view, turning the dial until the inner margins of these semicircles align and if there's a little pulse pressure we try to have it average so that the inner sides are aligned. The intraocular pressure in millimeters of mercury is 10 times what the dial reads. In this case, 15 millimeters of mercury. It's important that the width of the fluorescein band is about 10% the width of the, of the arc. Not too fat like this or too thin. So this is very thin. Very thin Myers will underestimate the intraocular pressure. Very thick Myers like this will overestimate it and this would be just about right. also don't want to be off-center. This is a sort of a funny drawing, but you also don't want the Myers to be perfect half circles or pretty close to perfect half circles. If the patient has a lot of astigmatism, then they will be oblong. And you can overcome this by making two measurements 90 degrees apart and averaging them, which is what I do. You can also line up the tonometer tip with the, the axis of the minus cylinder. Goldman tonometry requires a smooth cornea. It's affected, as I said, by corneal thickness. 
So a thick cornea overestimates the pressure, except in an edematous cornea, which underestimates the intraocular pressure. Thin corneas underestimate the pressure. So a lot of people who've had refractive surgery have thin corneas, and that makes intraocular pressure measurement a little bit challenging. Whenever we use any tonometer, we need to disinfect the tonometer. Things like Tonopen and Eye Care have disposable parts that are in contact with the patient, but the Goldman does not. So you can soak it in household bleach, sodium hypochlorite, or hydrogen peroxide, or isopropyl alcohol. You can also wipe it thoroughly with an alcohol swab and air dry it. In our clinic, the custom is to turn the tonometer tip backward after it's been clean so that the next person in the room knows that the tip is clean. The Perkins tonometer is a portable version. It's exactly the same Goldman applination tonometry, but it does not a part, it's not part of a slit lamp, so it can be used in patients who are unable to get to the slit lamp, they're wheelchair bound or physically unable to get to the slit lamp. Also for exams under anesthesia, using in children who are asleep. The strain gauge or tono pen is a, uses a strange electronic strain gauge to flatten the cornea. It takes four to 10 readings and yields a single, a single number. You can see 46 there. Very fine chirping as the results are taken and then the intraocular pressure is measured. Tonopen has the advantage of being very fast. It works well on scarred or irregular corneas. So it's often the tonometer of choice in the cornea clinic. Uh, in our department, the retina clinic uses it again because they, uh, it's fast, it's easily cleaned, and uh, the tips are easily disposed of. Rebound tonometry, or eye care, is relatively newer. There is a probe that is directed at the cornea and bounces back, and the device measures that rebound that occurs off the cornea. So this is the eye care in process. Very fast here, a little bit slower motion. You can see it bouncing off the cornea. The major advantage of rebound tonometry is the ability to check pressures in young children without giving them a drop of anesthesia. And this has really been transformational in terms of the number of times we have to take children back for exams under anesthesia. Because the children that we couldn't do tonopan or applination tonometry on, often we can use rebound tonometry. And then miscellaneous. So there are lots of ways to check the intraocular pressure. As I said before, I'll talk about Shiatz after the end of the, at the end of this talk, because some people will, will need to use it. And let me just say a few words about other types. So the dynamic contour tonometry, also called Pascal, is very ingenious. It has a concave sensor that is less affected by corneal thickness and really more accurate in uh, patients who have wide varieties of corneal thickness. It can also measure pulse amplitude. It's rather expensive and I think the reality of intraocular pressure is that the, and this will sound heretical, but the precise pressure is less important than the pressure in an individual. For example, if you know that somebody is getting worse at a pressure of 22 measured on a gold montanometer, it really doesn't matter if their actual pressure is 24 or 20. We know that we want to lower their intraocular pressure by 30% measured with the Goldman tonometry. So I, I think it is important to know the precise intraocular pressure, but it's uh, less important for day-to-day -day clinical care of an, intra of an individual patient than knowing their relative pressure compared to when they were being damaged. The new tonometer uh, uses a probe floating on a column of gas to measure intraocular pressure. Like the tono pen, it works pretty well on scarred corneas. Non-contact tonometry uses a puff of air that flattens the cornea. 
This is used by people who couldn't use topical anesthesia. So in the old days, optometry couldn't use topical drops, so they would use ear puff tonometry. It's fairly accurate in the normal range, but less accurate at high pressures. And some patients really dislike it because they find that blast of air to be quite startling and uncomfortable. And transpalpebral tonometry called the diaton. So the diaton measures intraocular pressure through the upper eyelid. It's helpful in eyes with corneal prostheses like the K-Pro. I have found the instructions with the, with the diaton to be almost impossible to understand. One of our residents, uh, Justin Rizma, has a really good tutorial on eye rounds on how to use the diaton. So if it's actually used correctly, it's fairly accurate at giving an approximation of the intraocular pressure. And that's beyond really the scope of this talk, but if, if one goes to eye rounds and diaton, uh, Justin will explain how to use it. So the key points in this talk, mean intraocular pressure is 15.5 millimeters of mercury. The pressure does not fit a bell-shaped curve skewed towards higher intraocular pressures. And 10% of adults have pressures over 21 millimeters of mercury. Goldmine applination tonometry is the gold standard for measuring intraocular pressure, and this is based on the Imbert Fick formula. It applinates a diameter of 3.06 millimeters. So an overview here of tonometry and the three types of tonometers that I think you'll run into mostly in your uh, practice. Obviously, if you're working in a practice that uses primarily a Pascal or Numa tonometry, you really would like to learn more about that. Let me just talk about Shiats for those who have one and are interested in it. Real advantages of the Shiats are that it's really inexpensive and it's really portable. You can just put it in your pocket. Patients anesthetize and lying supine and this device is held over the cornea and a weighted plunger indents the cornea. You can see that little plunger there. And the depth of indentation is measured on a scale. Unlike the Goldman tonometer, this really does displace fluid in the eye. Usually a 5.5 gram weight is used in the base standard setup, but one can add heavier weights to expand the scale at high intraocular pressures. So one looks up the scale reading on this table, revised in 1955, to find out what the intraocular pressure is. So the reading on the scale is not the intraocular pressure. This is measuring 11 using the 5.5 weight, 11 translates to six millimeters of mercury. And you can see there that you can use heavier and heavier weights to expand the scale. The Shias tonometry displaces so much fluid from the eye that a weighted Shiatz tonometer that was on the eye for four minutes and measured the drop in intraocular pressure caused by this weight squeezing the eye is called tonography, a technique that's no longer used. So Shiatz is, is a way that one can measure intraocular pressure. It has a lot of problems with accuracy and um, a lot of artifact, but it's better than nothing. So if one's uh, in an environment where there's no electricity or no other resources, Shiatz is certainly fine to use.